version of uh, QPL. So the series began seven years ago at the University of Ottawa, a small workshop founded by Peter Selinger under the name Quantum Programming Languages. And over the years, uh, Bob and I subverted it <laughs> to this present incarnation, Quantum Physics and Logic. <coughs>
susceptible to this kind of mathematical treatment. Um, some that may seem to not be dualities may then turn out to be dualities. So, for example, hot and cold may not seem like, like dual pairs, but in fact, in many statistical mechanical models, there can be an operation of replacing temperature by 1 over temperature. You can study some physical system at low temperatures by thinking of it as some other system at, at high temperatures, and that's a very important, important concept in, in thermodynamics. So there's always room to look for these dualities. Uh, the current most general concept of duality that I know arises in category theory. So in category theory, the fundamental duality is the act of reversing an arrow, thinking of an arrow from x to y as an arrow from y to x. So in, in category theory, we use this kind of basic duality to model the operation of so switching past and future, false and true, small and big, and an ordered set. Of the big elements. And so the idea is that every category has an opposite category where the arrows have been reversed. And this, in fact, gives us a symmetry of the whole theory of categories. You can say there's a category of all categories, and there's a functor from that called taking the opposite, uh, which is a symmetry. And in fact, that's the only symmetry of the theory of categories. If you, if you look at the automorphisms of the category of categories, it's Z mod 2 with this uh, non trivial element being opposite. So it's built into category theory that, that there is this duality. So, how does it manifest itself in more concrete situations? Well, in logic, it shows up as a negation. So, um, in, in many situations in logic, you have this negation operation on propositions, and if P implies Q, then not Q implies not P. And if we temporarily or maybe for the purposes of this talk, permanently ignore intuitionistic logic, which is very important, but it's not really the subject of this talk, then you have the not not p equals p. So, so it's a, an involution <coughs> that twice fits you back where you started from. So at least in non-intuitionistic logic, if you have some category where the objects are propositions and the morphisms are proofs, proofs going from one proposition as assumption to another as conclusion, you often expect that there's a functor from that category to the opposite of that category. In other words, a, an order reversing operation, whereby order reversing, uh, I mean, this, uh, this kind of factor here, with the property that if you do it twice, you get something back where you started from. You get a functor that's naturally isomorphic to the identity. So this kind of idea in logic shows up, interestingly, two analogous ways in quantum theory. The fact that it shows up twice is, I think, very important. It's, well, it's been somewhat mysterious. People are beginning to work it out. So first of all, already in the category of finite dimensional vector spaces, you see a duality. So if you let, in other words, we're not even Hilbert spaces yet, just finite dimensional vector spaces. Every vector space has a dual, and it, and if you have a linear operator from one vector space to another, then the get an adjoint operator going back between the duals. And if you restrict yourself to finite dimensional vector spaces, ignore infinite dimensional subtleties, you get back where you started if you take the double dual. So this notion of duality has been captured by the concept of a star autonomous category, which I'd like to explain partially because it took me much too long to understand it myself. Uh, so I think tell people who don't know about it yet, so they don't have to suffer quite as much as I did. So, so I won't define what I mean by a symmetric monoidal category, but roughly it's a category that has a tensor product uh, and a unit for the tensor product. So you could think of, for example, finite dimensional vector spaces with the usual tensor product, and then the ground field, say the complex numbers, is the unit for the tensor product. And so you want it to the unit to act like a unit, you want the tensor product to be associative, and you want it to be commutative up to some nice isomorphisms. And that's the subtlety I'm not explaining. But anyone who took the course this week earlier will have seen the, the details. So a symmetric monoidal category is called closed if for every object, say A, the functor, which is tensoring by A, has a right adjunct, which is called the internal Huh. <laughs> linear logic uh, is denoted by this funny kind of lollipop thing, which is supposed to sort of remind you of the implication symbol. And so what does that mean? If you know about adjoint functors, this will be delightful, but if you don't, it's what just seems mysterious. So it doesn't, it's not all that hard to understand. It just means that the set of 
stay within the world of vector spaces. And in classical logic, if you take the tensor product to be and, then this <coughs> internal palm is, is implied. So in other words, um, if I have a proof that A and X implies Y, I can get a proof that X implies the proposition A implies Y. And that's the basic relationship between the and and implied, is this adjunct functor relationship. So a symmetric monoidal closed category is called star autonomous if the way that this internal Hahn arises is a particular way. You have an object, which I guess is called bottom, that upside down T thing, such that if you define the dual of any object X to be X on bottom, then, well, you can check, you can work out that just from the stuff I've said so far, that there will, you'll get a canonical morphism from X to its double dual. In general, that doesn't need to be an isomorphism. For example, in the category infinite dimensional vector spaces, it, you'd have that morphism, but it wouldn't be invertible. Um, but you say your category is star autonomous if that is an isomorphism. And then you call this bottom a dualizing object. So that's a general notion of, of duality where duals arise by looking at the Hans into some special object. And then you can see quite easily that any star autonomous category will have this functor, the dual functor, sending objects to their duals, which will be a contravariant functor. So it's really a functor from C to C up. And if you do it twice, you get back where you started from. So, in the category of finite dimensional vector spaces, say over the complex numbers, if we're doing quantum mechanics, you could take the, the bottom uh, to be just the complex numbers, so then this is the usual dual of a vector space. Notice in this case here, what's happening is that the bottom object is the same thing as the unit of the tensor product. C is the vector space that tensor with it doesn't do anything. So, in that particular case, when the when the dualizing object is the unit for the tensor product, you say your category is compact, or compact closed. So in a compact category, and then you can see that a hon x is the same thing as a dual tensor x, the situation we're familiar with in, in, in linear algebra. But in classical logic, it works a bit differently. You take bottom to be the proposition false, so that the dual of x says x implies false, another way to say not x. Um, so here we're seeing that in this case it's different. The, the, the bottom is not the unit for the tensor product. The unit for and is true. So this is a different flavor of star autonomous category. And the, these two flavors are really uh, sort of the linear algebra flavor and the logic flavor. But the interesting thing is that in the category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, which is what, what you get when you enter the realm of quantum mechanics, there's also a different kind of duality at play, which people often get sort of tangled up with the first one. So we have duals for objects, as I've just described. This is what I was just talking about. Uh, so there's a dual of a finite dimensional Hilbert space. But there's something else which is that if you have a linear operator from a Hilbert space X to Hilbert space Y, you get a thing which I'll call the dagger of F going backwards, uh, which has the property that the inner product of the vector FX with Y is the same as the inner product of X with F dagger Y, where X and Y are vectors in these, in these Hilbert spaces. So, so this kind of uh, dagger operation is, is different than the dual operator. But you'll notice that this equation down here looks suspiciously similar to this isomorphism up here, um, with the inner product being somehow analogous to the hum. And so what's going on is sort of interesting. What's happening really is that a Hilbert space is like a miniature category. It's not a category, it's just a set. But it has some of the same structure that a category would have. So a category has a set of ways to go from one object to another. Whereas a Hilbert space just has a number to go from one state to another. In other words, there's an amplitude, an inner product, to go from one state to another. So, so 
and, and that's been sort of, hit, sort of hidden in plain sight for a long time, and that's the basis for, for phrases like adjoint operator. So, so this is the basic defining fact about adjoint operators, and this is the basic defining, sorry, about uh, adjoint functors, and this is the same thing for adjoint operators. So it's built into the terminology there. But, but what it means really, actually, I believe, is that whenever you have a Hilbert space, there's a chance that there's a category hiding in it. There's a chance that what you've done is what I call decategorify your category. And think of it as just a set, sort of squash it down because you don't know enough category theory to thinking of it as just a set. Um, and I've worked a lot on, on trying to make that, on trying to prove that point in various examples. So, but anyway, this concept, this other kind of duality is captured by the concept of a dagger category these days. So it's just one where every morphism from x to y gives you a morphism going back, a dagger, from y to x, and you demand a couple of obvious properties here. So any dagger category will have a functor dagger going from c to c off, such that if you do it twice, you get back from where you started from. So you'll notice that that fact about dagger categories looks a lot like this fact about star autonomous categories, um, but here it's the, uh, it's the star, and there it's the dagger, and in, and in the category of five dimensional Hilbert spaces you have both, and they're different, uh, and so you can get very confused, but, but by now people have to straighten it up. So when you have both, you have a very interesting rich structure, which has been studied a lot in these, in these parts. Uh, so it's called a dagger compact category. So that's a dagger category, it's a compact category, and then you want some compatibility. You want all the relevant natural isomorphisms, so there are various things that are true only up to isomorphism in a symmetric monoidal category. You want all those isomorphisms to be unitary, so you can define a unitary morphism in any dagger category can be one where the dagger, dagger is the inverse. And also you would like the dagger of the unit, which is some God-given map you have in any compact category, to be the co-unit, followed by the symmetry which twists the two. So this has been nicely worked out in papers by Bob Kirby, Saxon, Ramsky, Peter Selinger, and others so have gone ahead with it and tried to really formulate uh, a lot of quantum mechanics at a kind of abstract level in terms of dagger compact categories. So, dagger compact categories are really related to Heisenberg's idea of matrix mechanics. So, Heisenberg actually didn't know what a matrix was. He reinvented matrices, and then his advisor, Born, told him, hey, you invented matrices, go read a book. Um, so, <clears throat> we never liked the term matrix mechanics, and I just realized maybe that's why. <laughs> uh, so, so he thought of them somewhat like this. You have some set of states of your system, and you do some process to it. And for any input state and any output state, there will be some complex number, an amplitude, for going from one state to the, to the next. And so then you get a matrix of, of amplitudes. But it's really important, I think, to think of those amplitudes quite uh, literally as being numbers labeling edges in some kind of graph of this sort to, to see that this matrix formalism is not some kind of abstract thing. And so the point is that if you do one process and then do another process, you have lots of ways to get from some initial state i to some final state k. You go through any intermediate state j. And the basic rule is that to get the amplitude to go from i to k, you have to sum over all paths, so sum over all intermediate states j. And then, you know, what he sums is the amplitude for each path. And the way you get an amplitude for a specific path is you multiply the amplitudes for the two paths that are the parts of it. So this is the formula for matrix multiplication, of course, but this is how Heisenberg sort of reinvented it. And, and so this is what's, this is a baby version of what Feynman later called a path integral. So you can imagine a more sophisticated situation in which instead of a discrete set of states, you have a continuum of them, and then instead of summing over these amplitudes, you have to take a, uh, an integral, and that's roughly the idea of a path integral. You might also have to, um, you might also have infinitely many matrices that you're multiplying, and that's typical on a path integral. So the path integral formalism is just, is just this. But 
the interesting thing is that matrix mechanics is much more general concept. It works with all sorts of other rings replacing the complex numbers, or even rings replacing the complex numbers. So a ring is a ring without <coughs> N, which stands for negative, apparently. Uh, and so that's, you just drop everything about subtraction and you get a, get a, a rig. So, for what are some examples here? Well, there's a rig of the numbers, uh, of the positive numbers, not negative numbers, with the usual plus and times. So now you can think of, of these matrix elements as giving probabilities, or we can say relative probabilities, because they might be bigger than one, uh, to go from one state the next. So if you've ever studied something like Markov processes or stochastic processes, you'll know that you, you can calculate the amplitude for some kind of random walk to get from here to here by doing this exact same formula here, but now it's not complex amplitudes you're studying, it's, it's probabilities that you're studying. So that would be this other rig. Um, there's another rig which is just the, the boolean, it's true and false, with or as plus and and as the time. So now, so now the idea is that you just get the possibility rather than probability to go from one state to another. So for example, if you're trying to get from, from Heathrow to here by buses, you just want to know whether it's possible, you or over the various routes to see if, you know, can I do it this way? Well, to do it this way, I have to do this route and this. So you or over a bunch of ands to compute a possibility. Um, of course, this kind of composition of matrices with Boolean entries goes under lots of other names. And mathematicians would call these matrices relations, and this would be the usual composition of relations. Um, some other people would call these matrices digital circuits, where you have some input gates that have zeros and ones on them, and some output gates that have some zeros and ones on them. And this is the operation of sticking together digital circuits. But they're really all the same thing. There's another rig, perhaps a little less familiar, but incredibly important, called, uh, called R min, which is the real numbers together with plus infinity. Here, it's a little confusing at first. The, the addition is minimization, and the multiplication is plus. Uh, and this is what happens when you are trying to work out the action in classical mechanics from one state to another. So this actually shows up in the study of the uh, principle of least action. So the idea here is that you're saying, what's the amount of action that I must incur, some number, to get from here to here? Well, I'll take the root of minimum action, so, I'm, so this sum here should be replaced by a minimum. And then for each path, the way I compute the action of that path is I take the action of the first step plus the action of the second step. So in that Heathrow to Oxford example, instead of action, you could call it the cost. So you can say, what's the cost of a bus ride from one place to another? So you, you minimize over, possible, over routes the sum of the cost of each stage of the journey. And we include plus infinity to mean you can't afford it. So plus infinity, that amount of cost means that uh, you can't get there at all. Um, and that, that is an important thing to have because that is, I guess, the uh, unit for minimization. Anything min infinity is that anything. So in the continuum limit, with, when you do matrix mechanics with this rig, you get um, the principle of least action in classical mechanics. And this has been worked out quite nicely in a bunch of literature under names certain keywords that you might not have guessed. Uh, this is called idempotent analysis, and it's also called tropical algebra for some interesting reason that doesn't bear repeating. So, um, so if you look under those keywords, you'll see that people have developed the subject quite extensively, and one thing that's very interesting about it is that there's a way to, uh, def there's a way to, um, sorry, there's a way to deform uh, this uh, rig here down to, well, sorry, just to deform this one to this one here. So you can think of uh, statistical mechanics with its probabilities as reducing to this, uh, to this principle of least action in the low temperature limit. You can also think about 
quantization is a process of deforming this classical rig, the rig of this mini rig, to the complex numbers. So, so the point is that matrix mechanics is a very general tool that, that works in lots of different subjects. And indeed, for any community rig, you get a compact category of these matrices. So the objects of the natural numbers, so I was drawing a of diagrams with three dots, so there would be an object three, and a morphism from one natural number to another is just an n, n by n matrix with entries in that rig. So if your rig is also a star rig, that is, if there's some an analog of complex conjugation, then your uh, category here becomes a dagger compact category, where the dagger of the matrix is defined in the usual way that you're familiar with the quantum mechanics, you take the, the conjugate transpose. And in fact, actually, every rig becomes a star rig if you want. You can, if you want, just define a star to be A. So there's no limitation here. But of course, for interesting examples like the complex number, the star is not trivial, it's doing something interesting. So, so anyway, whenever you have a star rig, then you get a dagger compact category. So in other words, that uh, handles the example that I mentioned before of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. The category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces is what you get when you take the star rig to be the complex numbers, but you could also take it to be any of those other things I was talking about. So we've seen lately, people have seen that, for example, the category of relations acts in some ways a lot like the category of finite Hilbert spaces, but we can also take this R min as our rig, and then we get a dagger compact category that applies to classical mechanics rather than quantum mechanics, where the where what you're doing is you're, you're when you're multiplying these matrices, you're implementing the principle of least action. And so one thing that I've been going on about lately to anyone who will listen to me is that we should think more about classical mechanics. Classical mechanics is more interesting than it's given credit for. Uh, and in particular, all these uh, things people are doing with quantum mechanics and dagger compact categories, you should attempt to generalize it to classical mechanics. And it works better than you might think. In particular, when, when quantum computation people say things like classical information, I urge you to be careful that they're not whether they know it or not, they're not using classical to mean classical mechanics. They may think they are, but they aren't actually ever doing anything with classical mechanics when they say the word classical. Usually they say the word classical when they mean, I'm thinking about the category of sets. Uh, but classical mechanics is a much richer structure than just arbitrary sets and functions. And, and it involves dagger compact categories. And so a lot of things that people think of as special features of quantum mechanics actually apply to classical mechanics if you pay attention. I'll say a bit more about that later. So I just want to illustrate the use of this in uh, some you know, this way of thinking in uh, analyzing a particular little puzzle that has been around for a while. So um, there, there are various star rigs running around in nature real numbers, the complex numbers, but also the quaternions. And you can try forming this, these uh, matrix, matrix categories with various ones of these. So you can get the category of finite dimensional real Hilbert spaces, or complex ones, or quaternionic ones. And it's been a long-standing puzzle in the foundations of quantum mechanics. Why does nature like the complex case better? There are a lot of theorems, and we heard some from uh, Howard Barnum yesterday did, did say that you have these three choices, uh, and then you're left wondering why nature picked one of them. Well, I should admit that the, the quaternions are a little bit different from the other two because quaternions aren't commutative, so in fact, what you, you don't get a dagger compact category in this case because you don't get a symmetric monoidal category. You just get a monoidal category here, but apart from that, it's it's just as good. It does have tools of both, both types. Um, so we should ask, you know, what's so great about the complex case? And the answer, I think, is that in fact, nature loves all three of these categories equally well, and they fit together in a beautiful whole. And so in fact, nature hasn't picked one or the other. It's picked 
with all three. Now to understand this, it helps a lot if you work with Hilbert spaces that have a little bit more structure. These Hilbert spaces are sort of anonymous, they only depend on their dimension. So it helps to think about them with a little bit more structure. And this, uh, sorry if this sounds complicated, but this is sort of the simplest structure that physicists think about. They'll think about some group acting on the, on the Hilbert space. So technically it's probably good to think about a compact topological group, say like a Lie group, like SUN or something. Uh, acting in a continuous unitary way on your Hilbert space. And we're, let's start out with finite dimensional complex Hilbert spaces. So this category of representations of our fixed group G on finite dimensional complex Hilbert spaces, that's a dagger compact category. And this is the kind of category that, that uh, particle physicists love to study. So you tell them, what's the gauge? You ask, they will ask you, what's your gauge group? And you tell them, my favorite group is SU3. And then they say, oh good, I know about that. That's and the strong force, and then the quark is some object in here, and an anti-quark is the dual object, and so on. So they, they'll get very happy working with these categories. But the interesting thing is that the category where you're looking at the complex representations also contains in it the categories where you're looking at the real or the quaternionic representations. So this is an old fact. So Jamie Vickery said, me last night. That's just the Frobenius Schur indicator. And yes, it is just the Frobenius Schur indicator. Um, but, but, but somehow not everyone knows about the Frobenius Schur indicator. Um, and so Freeman Dyson tried to uh, popularize it a little bit by calling it the threefold way. He wrote a very nice paper about that, which not enough people have read. Um, let me just tell you about that. So if you're given this category of unitary representations of a group, you can ask, is an object isomorphic to its dual? Um, well, let's suppose that that object is irreducible. It's not a direct sum of other objects. Then it turns out there's three choices. So either it's not isomorphic to its dual, or it is. Well, that sounds like two choices. Uh, but if it is isomorphic to its dual, there are two different things that can happen. Either it could be real, or it could be quaternion. By saying real, what I mean is that this complex Hilbert space is really the complexification of a representation of our group on a real space. So if you start with a real representation, you can just take formal complex linear combinations to get a complex representation. That's what it means for a representation to be real. It has an underlying real representation. Similarly, it could be quaternionic, meaning that it could come from a representation on a quaternionic Hilbert space by forgetting that it's quaternionic Hilbert space, just working with a complex Hilbert space, because the complex numbers are sitting inside the quaternions. So the, the proof of this, which I'll just sketch, and there's more detail in the notes on my web page, is uh, it's very simple and pretty. So if you have a period, and you don't need to know much about group representation, I'm just sort of asserting the, the little bits of fact that you need to do to carry out this proof. So if your object, if your representation here is irreducible, there's a one-dimensional space of morphisms from it to itself. That's called Schur's lemma in group theory. So, so if the object is morphic to its dual, that means there's got to be a one-dimensional object, a one-dimensional space of morphisms from it to its dual. Uh, and so that means if you if you pop this dual over to the other side, it means there's a one-dimensional space of morphisms from x tensor x to the complex numbers. But if you tensor a vector space with itself, it breaks up into two parts, the symmetric two tensors and the anti-symmetric tensors. So, because there's just a one-dimensional space of morphisms from x tensor x to c, that means that either you get a morphism from, from here to c or from here to c. So, in other words, either you get a non-zero uh, bilinear parent that's symmetric or skew-symmetric. One or the other, but not both. And that's the origin of these two cases. So either way, you can write that pairing in terms of the inner product.
that j squared is equal to 1. And in a version of this talk on my, on my uh, website, I give the proof of that. It's, it's very short, but I find that people actually don't like to hear proofs and talks. So I won't do that part. Uh, so, so what operator do you know that when you square it equals 1 and it anti-commutes with i? Well, complex conjugation. So this operator j should think of it as being like complex conjugation. In particular, you can look at the subspace of vectors that are fixed by that j. That will be a real subspace that when you complexify it, you get back to the representation. So it's just like the, the real number sitting inside of the complex numbers. So that case there is the real case. On the other hand, if g is skew symmetric, you can see that you can rescale j to get j squared equals minus 1. And then you ask, where have I ever seen something where j squared equals minus 1 in an anti to i? And you think the quaternions. You could define k to be i times j. And then you can check, from what I've said so far, that the relationships of the quaternions hold. Uh, it's a little calculation. So, so in that case, what we're saying is that our Hilbert space actually becomes a, a quaternionic Hilbert space. Uh, and our, the way we were originally thinking of it is we were just neglecting the J and the K and only thinking about the complex Hilbert space. So let me show you an example of how this, this works. So the group that most people know about representations of is SU2. That's the group that shows up in angular momentum. So every representation of SU2 um, is isomorphic to its own dual. That's an incredibly special feature of SU2. And there's one irreducible representation of each dimension, but physicists like to label these representations by something called a spin. So there's a spin 0, spin 1 half, spin 1, and so on. And those are just the representations of the dimensions 1, 2, 3, and so on. So if the spin is an integer, then the spin j wrap is real in the sense that I've described. But if it's a half integer, it's quaternionic. So for example, the spin 1 representation of SU2, it's called a vector representation. And the real the reason why is because it's just, well, it's a, a three-dimensional representation on C3, but it's just coming from a representation on R3. So SU2 is the double cover of the rotation group. And you can rotate vectors in three dimensions, but that gives you a representation on C3. So these are just vectors in some glorified sense. But the spin one half representation, which is the representation that all you quantum information people seem to love the most, uh, is the it's called the spinner representation. It's actually the underlying complex representation of a quaternionic ret. So in other words, as when SU2 is acting on, on C2, it might as well, you might as well think of those two complex numbers as a single quaternion. The whole structure of the quaternionic vector space is getting preserved. So, in other words, maybe a flashy way to remember this is that when you hear the word qubit, you may think that the Q stands for quantum, but it can equally well stand for quaternion. Um, so spin one half particles really are quaternions. The, the, the quaternionic Hilbert space structure is getting preserved by, by rotations. So if people ask, well, why don't quaternions show up more in quantum physics? Well, they, they do show up. They just start looking. They're right there. Um, every electron is one. So, and there are lots of quaternions. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what's the physical meaning of the J in this case? Well, you can work out what it means by noticing that um, because I said the quaternionic structure is getting preserved, if I have any rotation, this is just a name for a, a rotation, an element of SU2, really, it, it commutes with J. Uh, so if you differentiate that relation with respect to theta, that set theta equals zero, you get this. Here, J, IJ is my name for an element of the Lie algebra of SU2. Uh, because physicists like J is self IJ would be the element of the Lie algebra. So you get this relationship, but because of I and J anti commute, that's saying that when you, uh, if you just divide both sides of the equation by I, you get this formula. So what's happening is that this J operation is reversing the angular momentum. So physicists know about this. That there's an operator uh, on, the, on, the, on C2 which has the effect of, of, of reversing the. In other words, it anti commutes with the three uh, poly matrices. So it reverses angular momentum. And the physical meaning of this operator in, is time reversal. So if you have a spin on half particle, you should think of it as spinning around. And when you hit it with this operator in J, it spins around the other direction. And the momentum flips. So time reversal.
universal is sort of built into the structure of, of the math here. One last little point about this. So, I haven't been doing too many diagrams, but uh, if you've attended the class or the papers about quantum information theory from a category theoretic point of view, you know that you can think of an operator from x into x to c as a cup shaped thing. And the idea that it, uh, that, that happens is that uh, because of it gives you a nice amorphism between x and its dual, it means there's also a corresponding cap that satisfies these zigzag identities. But the two choices, the symmetric and anti-symmetric choice of G, give rise to these two possibilities here. So when you have a real self-dual object, that is one with J squared equals one, the cup and the cap and the switching operation fit together to have this property here going around like this is the identity but for the quaternionic ones it's equal to minus the identity and, and that's very beautiful because another way to think about this little twist thing that I'm drawing here is you can think of it as the operation of turning something around 360 degrees so like if you drew this if you made this out of a little ribbon and you pulled the ribbon tight you'd see the ribbon would twist around 360 degrees so these quaternionic representations of SE2, the half integer spin representations, they very, very naturally have the property that when you turn them around 360 degrees, they pick up a minus sign. That's what happens with an electron, whereas with the uh, other ones, you don't. So, so the point is that all that is nicely built into the very abstract category theory of this um, compact dagger category of representations of our group. Uh, so the threefold way basically says that there are these choices here are complex, real, and quaternionic. And if you look at Hilbert spaces that are either complex, real, or quaternionic, they'll have groups of symmetries that are some very famous groups. So there's the unitary group, but if you demand that it preserve a real structure, it reduces to something called the orthogonal group. Whereas if you demand that it preserve a quaternionic structure, it's called the symplectic group. And these are the so-called classical groups. There's a classification of simple Lie groups. And this accounts for most of them. They're just five weirdos that are related to something more sophisticated that I'm not going to talk about, which is triality, which is associated to the Arctonians. So this, so let's talk about duality, but there's some weird thing called triality. I won't get into it. It's much more mysterious. Now, when it comes to duality, categories are really just the beginning. Because in addition to categories, you have two categories and three categories and so on. This is a big long story, which I can't possibly tackle here. Um, but I just want to say a couple of words about how it interacts with duality. So you can look at uh, an n plus k category that's boring at the bottom k levels. You can think of that as a special sort of n category, because it's trivial at the bottom levels, and focus on the n the interesting levels on top. I'll call it, say, a K-monoidal N category. And there's a guess as to what these gadgets are like, which is called the periodic table. This is a, the beginning of it. This is just it's an infinite table. This is just a portion of it. So, for example, a one-monoidal set. A, a set is a zero category. Okay? It has no, nothing above objects or elements. A one monoidal zero category is really a one category with only one object. So a category with only one object, that's called a monoid. It's, it's one object and a bunch of morphisms from that object to itself that you can compose in an associated way. And if you keep on working out what kinds of things you get, you get all sorts of interesting kinds of categories. And you'll notice that as you march down one of these columns, you get structures which are in some sense more and more commutative. And there's a conjecture called the stabilization hypothesis that says that after you get down to a certain point here, it, you don't get anything more interesting. So when you get down to k equals n plus 2, it, it settles down. Uh, and so it takes longer each time. So recently, uh, Jacob Lurie and Andre Joyal have given proofs of this stabilization uh, hypothesis in different formalisms. There are also other proofs in other formalisms. Uh, so, so when, when uh, my collaborator James Dolan and I were thinking about this, we were really interested in categories with duals. Duals at all levels, objects, morphisms, and so on. Uh, and we had this hypothesis that the end category framed n-dimensional tangles in an n plus k-dimensional cube is the free k-monoidal n-category with duals on one object. So that's a big 
mouthful there. So let's take n and k to be 1. So then a, a one monoidal one category is just a monoidal category. And we're looking at one-dimensional tangles in a one-dimensional, sorry, in a one plus one-dimensional cube. That is, one-dimensional tangles in a square. The tangle is just a little thing like I've drawn here. And, and, and pictures like this are the morphisms in a monoidal category with duals. And when I say with duals, I mean duals of both kinds. So, it's a compact, well, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a dagger category. You can, you can turn these pictures, you can reflect these pictures vertically, and that's the dagger operation on morphisms. But also, every object has a dual, which gives you these caps and cups. So, in terms of applications to physics, you can think of this as these pictures here as pictures of particles moving around in a two dimensional space time. But you could do this in other dimensions. So, you could, uh, you could you could jack up k1, and now you have particles in a three-dimensional space-time. That would be the three braided monoidal category on one object, option of tools. Or you could go up again one more and get to symmetric monoidal categories with tools. And those are just the compact, I'm uh, sorry, the dagger compact categories that I've been talking about. So there's been a lot of work lately on dagger compact categories, and I want to make the point that that is sort of just one special case of this, of this pattern here. It's the special case that people would have come up with if they lived in a world with three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. There, uh, see, when, we're, when we only have two dimensions of space, we're in a, we've got a braided monoidal category, we can't switch this and, and this. Here I mean two dimensions of space and one dimension of time. The vertical dimension here is meant to be time. Uh, but when you get up to an extra dimension of space, then, you, then, you, then there aren't these two different ways of switching things anymore. You have the symmetric monoidal category. So I, I believe that the reason why dagger compact categories are showing up in physics and logic is because we, the physicists and the logicians are living in this world of three dimensions of space and one dimension. Or at least they think they are. Um, some string theorists don't think they are uh, living in that world. Uh, so, so, that, so that's the case here where we're dealing with um, uh, point particles moving around in a four dimensional space time. But there, there, there are many other cases. So, here, when we get up to the two category case, we're dealing not with point particles moving around in space times of different dimension, but with one dimensional extended objects moving around in these various dimensions. And that's where what string theorists like to think about. And so they, they have some other more fancy things going on. So you can try taking ideas that you know and love about compact dagger categories and looking at what they give you in other points in this periodic table. So for example, there's a subject that you can call the categorified matrix mechanics, where instead of dealing with symmetric monoidal categories, you're dealing with symmetric two categories with duals. Uh, so I think that uh, Jamie Fickery and Bruce Bartlett will give a talk that may mention profunctors, maybe not, but secretly it's about profunctors. Uh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Uh, so th that's just the theory of profunctors is just a categorified version of the theory of matrices. So instead of so a matrix is Right, you've got two sets, you take the product of the two sets, and you look at the function from the product of the two sets to numbers, that's called a matrix. So if you just replace those sets by categories and look at a functor from a product of two categories to another category, for example, a set, that's called a profunctor. And you can compose these things by just a, something very much like matrix multiplication. But now instead of just a category of them, you have a two category. You have natural transformations between and this thing has duals for objects. The dual of a category in the world of profunctors is just its opposite. So we're getting an interesting little self-referential loop here because I introduced opposites to, to motivate the whole interest in duality, but now we're seeing the opposite is an example of a dual. Um, profunctors don't have duals at all levels, but you can get something better by to have duals at all levels by working with some gadgets called two Hilbert spaces. They're a categorified version of Hilbert spaces. And, and Bruce and Jamie have done a lot of work on two Hilbert spaces. But I just want to say in the last minute one word about profunctors. So as you probably heard, uh, you get some very nice
nice examples of this compact dagger category of formalism by looking at two-dimensional uh, topological quantum field theories, looking at these two-dimensional cobordisms. And they're all, you can build them all up from these basic building blocks. And when you have a two-dimensional TQFT, all of those are getting mapped over to the category of finite dimensional vector spaces. So you've got a vector space for the circle, and it's equipped with a multiplication operation and a unit for the multiplication, but also a, also a co-unit and co-multiplication, which are like upside down versions. And they satisfy a bunch of laws that are all coming from the topology. So an algebra would have an associative law and unit law. A co-algebra would have co-associativity and co-unit laws. And then if the algebra is commutative, the co-algebra is also co-commutative. Uh, but that follows from the rest. And then the marvelous thing is this Frobenius law, which relates the uh, multiplication and the co-multiplication. So if you warp this picture around it, you'll get this, this picture here. So that, that's something that has recently, so it's, it's recently been important in a lot of different ways. It started out being important uh, for people working on two-dimensional topological quantum field theories, but lately, in quantum information people, in quantum information theory, people have noticed that a Frobenius algebra structure on a Hilbert space is really a way of equipping it with a specific orthonormal basis. So you can think of it as a classical structure on a quantum system, a way to, uh, to, to know what, how to duplicate states. So the, the point there is simply that you can't du correctly duplicate all states in a quantum system, but if you pick a basis, you can duplicate those states, and that gives you a co-multiplication on your Hilbert space. So that, that came as a big surprise to me when I heard that 2D TQFTs were the same thing as classical structures on a Hilbert space. But there's a, sort of even another way to think about what's going on due to Ross Street, where he thinks about something like uh, Frobenius algebras, but not in the world of vector spaces, but in the world of profunders. And it turns out that you get one of these from a star autonomous category. So if you have a star autonomous category, you can have objects like A, B, and C, then you, you can think of all the different logical operations as being corresponding to these different cohortisms. So here, here what I mean is that if you label the input circle by A and the output circles by B and C, then, then here this little thing corresponds to a matrix element. But now a matrix element is not a number, it's a set. And it's the set of proofs that start with the assumption A and end with the conclusion B or C. And then it turns out that all the laws of logic are captured. All the laws of logic for star autonomous categories are captured by these pictures I drew. And in particular, this picture here, sort of the most exciting one, is this rule that logicians call the cut rule, the sort of most exciting aspect of, of this kind of proof theory. So, well, that went by too fast, but my time is up, so it should, should be done. So here's a summary of some of the sort of new points I was trying to make. Uh, so I want to emphasize that matrix mechanics is something you can do over any commutative star rate, and you can use matrix mechanics to describe both quantum and classical physics. So if you go to my webpage, you'll see Aaron Phineas has a no-cloning theorem for classical mechanics, and I think that's a very interesting <coughs> Thing. So, try to build a classical machine that duplicates a classical system. Try to actually build one on your desk, and you'll find that it won't work. Um, the study of duality combines real, complex, and quaternionic quantum mechanics into a single theory, and it's a theory that physicists have already been using, perhaps without noticing it sufficiently. Um, dagger compact categories are really just a specific case of these k monoidal n categories with duals, and it's the one that you'd expect to be important for particles in 4D space time, but, the, but there are really lots of other cases to, to study. And finally, this last point, which seems very mysterious to me, I just want to throw it out for your consideration.
sometimes it's a three-dimensional one. You, you can get to the higher dimensional ones, and they, are, they live in other slots in that periodic table. So, okay, I have two questions. The first is, um, there's this duality between propositional logic and center. And I think if you take the category you were talking about, it seems to be related to... Sorry, which one? The, the category that you attach to a logical system. Uh -huh. It looks to me like it's it's dual to Rotary's idea of side. It would be something like a star is on this category, the one I'm talking about. Yeah. So you can get one. Yeah, you can get one from sheaves on the side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that, that that's I mean, right. one observation. The other question is: Is this conjecture about stabilization related to the stabilization of the homotopy groups of the spheres? Yes, it is. Yeah, that was some evidence for it. So you can see that the uh, pi n plus k of Sn stabilizes when you jack up n high enough. And that, that would follow from the stabilization. I mean, it's true, but it would, it would follow from the stabilization hypothesis. So it's really yeah, evidence for it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So what is the basic idea beyond the Classical no cloning. Um, so the well, the, so well, okay. So the very basic idea is that the category of symplectic manifolds, which is the category that shows up in classical mechanics, um, isn't Cartesian. So there's no morphism from a symplectic manifold to it times itself. Just like there isn't a, uh, I mean, there isn't. Yeah, it's analogously not to how. Category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, that's not Cartesian, and you don't have something from H to H tensor H that duplicates all states. You want to, you, you want, he improves the statement of it a bit because you, you I mean, there's a the really good statement of the quantum no cloning theorem goes further than just saying that there's no map that duplicates all states from, from H to H tensor H, and so you can copy that in the symplectic. World. So, so symplectic geometry is the is the right framework, one of the right frameworks for classical mechanics. So, if the space of states of a classical system is a symplectic manifold, and any process that you can that you can do in classical mechanics is called a symplectomorphism. And so, so the point is that there's a lot more structure there. Than